Hello everyone, I'm Think Tank. If this is your first time watching me, I'm a Unity developer who's learning Godot by recreating, or perhaps better realizing my first game, Sewer Sweep in Godot. All the work for this video was done long before I released my Godot retrospective video, and contributed a lot to my talking points there. So I won't be going into much detail about anything that overlaps with that here. If you want to see me go into more detail about any of those things, you can just go watch my retrospective. This was a weird episode to work on. Since all the footage and notes were 6 plus months old, it felt kind of like doing archaeological research on myself. Surprisingly though, I had a lot fewer of those what the heck was I thinking moments while going through what I did for this episode than I expected to have, so I guess that means I'm getting better at Godot. Hopefully. <laughs> Alright, there's a lot of stuff to cover and I want to get started, so let's just get right into the video. The very first thing I tried to do was to reorganize the project, because let's face it, it's a mess. I broke the cardinal rule of game development, according to my professor, having good organization. I thought I could just drag everything around to new folders and get it all organized better, and so I did. However, Godot didn't like that, and all my references to files broke, which was horrifying to see, and if it weren't for me setting up a GitHub repository at the end of the last episode, I would have had a really bad time trying to fix that. So I just rolled back to the previous commit and everything was back to its messy yet functional glory. I've heard that this is fixed in the latest version of Godot and one of the first things I'm going to be doing for the next episode is to update the project. So I can try reorganizing again then, but for the time being, the messy project stays. I also fixed the stuttering issue I had with the camera when it tracked the player. In Unity, I always make sure my camera tracking updates at the same frequency as my tracked target updates, but I hadn't done that in Godot yet because Godot has a built-in smooth tracking feature, so I just turned it on and forgot about it. If you change the process callback mode from idle to physics, it will update in the physics process loop just like your character body 2D. Now I have smooth tracking, which is super important for avoiding any kind of motion sickness or eye fatigue when playing a game. I should have mentioned the included camera tracking in my Godot retrospective, because this is another thing that makes the engine so approachable for aspiring game devs and speeds up development time for everyone. At this point, I wasn't really sure what to work on next, but then I stumbled upon some other indie devs using something called context steering in their games, and was blown away with the modularity and flexibility it had, all while providing incredibly realistic AI behavior, so I decided to take a crack at it myself. Basically, context steering is a way to let AIs decide the best path to take to reach a target, given information about their surroundings and any additional context like favoring a set distance from their target or an orientation related to their target, like trying to get behind it or circle it. The target can be any point in space, either a random point or a node's position. I use a sum of the most desirable vectors for my AI, but if you want to be accurate to retro game 8-axis movement, you could just pick the vector with the highest interest and use that instead. This creates natural pathing around obstacles and is the same way a real animal would navigate its environment. It only breaks down if the target is directly on the other side of an obstacle, but that can be fixed by using pathfinding systems like A star or the navigation system nodes in Godot. Also, in the event you're generating a random point to walk to, a ray or sphere cast to check that the point isn't behind a wall might be a good idea. I'm not doing the pathfinding or obstruction check yet, but I will in the future. Once I had this set up, it was working pretty well, but I ran into an issue where a creature would get cornered and would start freaking out. I addressed this issue by giving the creatures a rolling store of the last 30 vectors they chose to move in, and then getting the sum of the dot products for them and multiplying it by the magnitude of its current direction vector. I know that sounds really complicated, but basically, if the 30 most recent directions it's tried to move in are all very different, it will cancel out the movement, but the more similar they are, the less their movement will be affected. I call this their directional memory. It provides pretty good results, but isn't perfect. Once I have the better pathfinding and obstruction check implemented, the only situation a creature would reasonably get cornered in is if it's being chased by the player, so it should fit that scenario pretty well. I might also have them just break out of their movement state if they detect they're being obstructed. I'm going to make a more in-depth video about how I use the context steering pattern in Godot, where I get into the technical implementation I used, so if you're interested, be on the lookout for that coming soon. With my fancy new AI behavior implemented, I created a new enemy type. The bug, we'll call it. Now, I need to be clear. I like bugs in general, 
I think they're really cool, and for a while growing up I wanted to be an entomologist, which is someone who studies bugs. These guys, though... I only put them in here because of course they're in sewers. It's one of the biggest reasons I don't go down there. The other reason being interdimensional clown demons, but those are more rare. Just a side note here, sewers are actually really cool. They're like modern day labyrinths. I've been watching videos about sewer systems to get ideas, and these things can have like anything in them. This one in St. Louis has an old civil defense shelter connected to it, abandoned subways, and even cave systems. I was originally worried I wouldn't have enough variety to choose from when designing environments, but there's actually a lot of cool stuff I can do. Anyway, these bugs are fast, but weak. I want them to be a swarming enemy that can overwhelm you, and I'd like to eventually have them grab onto you and do damage over time or something like that. They're gross, and you should be scared of them. I will eventually include a flamethrower just for them. At some point after creating the bugs, I also created crabs. I forgot to include their creation in my notes, so I have no idea when I did this, but these guys were in the original version, and they had the ability to grab onto you and keep you from moving, which I was super proud of at the time. I think that's still a cool idea, so I'm going to try and figure out the best way to do that. I'm thinking of adding an immobilized status that interrupts movement and then just have them apply it. The floating sphere enemies, which were supposed to be placeholders, have been recolored and might end up staying, actually. I ended up calling them Bet's Spheres, after the curiosity of the same name, a cannonball-sized sphere that was observed to move on its own. They'll be a rare spawn, but I think it would be neat to leave them in. They can't be stunned, but they can be knocked back very easily. That's it for enemies for now, but I have a lot more ideas that I can implement, and maybe I can do that in the next episode. I realized while working on these new creatures that my code for the health component was disgusting, and had to check on the component to see if it was attached to a creature and would run specific code only in that scenario. So I removed that code, but realized it kind of had to be there for stun behavior to work correctly, so I'll have to address that design flaw later, though I did get it at least working for now, and added the ability to restore health. I immediately made use of that ability and made a heart entity that when walked over by a player will restore a small amount of health. I figured that this was a good time to come up with a solution for dropping items in general, so I created a loot container component that can be configured with an array of packed scenes it can choose from to drop when activated. For right now, it's just a simple array, but I want to eventually create loot tables that I can assign with percentages and all that good stuff. All it should require is a way to get the packed scene reference from the table so it shouldn't be hard to add later. After that, I changed the way items work when they're dropped into the world. Originally, they were a separate scene called an item pickup, but for a number of reasons, I wasn't crazy about that. It would have a copy of the item sprite and an arrow that shows up when the player is standing over it and had a reference to a pack scene of the weapon that it would pass to the inventory to be instanced. This wasn't ideal for a couple of reasons, but the biggest one was that I had to have separate item pickups for every weapon, which bloated the project and also would have made unique items really difficult to make. I'd like to eventually have weapons that can have modifiers on them and potentially condition a rarity, and since you can't just instance a runtime scene, it has to be saved to disk to be instanced, the old approach wasn't going to work. What I ended up doing was just folding the important parts of item pickup into the item node and disabled the arrow when it's picked up. Now an item persists between being held and dropped on the ground. Finally, with all my items situated, ignore the magical hands attached to them, I'll fix that later, I redid some existing weapon sprites and made some new ones which will be implemented later. I also went and added the broom as a joke weapon, since the game is called Sewer Sweep. I discovered while working on the items that my inventory code was very buggy, so I reworked it. I won't go into detail about how it works because I forgot how it works, but it does work, and that's all that matters. Now it can handle picking up items, dropping them, picking up items when the inventory is already full, and switching held items. There is a bug I noticed with the starting weapons not being dropped sometimes when you pick up a new one, or at least that's what it seems like. I'm not entirely sure yet though, so I'll have to figure out what the actual issue is in the next episode. But other than that, it works much better now. Also look at this, I forgot I added the ability to pause the game. I surprised myself while grabbing footage of the bug. I think I must have randomly added this more recently and never made a note of that. Anyway, I was really feeling the urge to do some art after all this coding, so I created a template sprite for humans and then redid the player avatar using that template. Now John Sweep has an actual face. The whole entire head is a gas mask thing gave me Doctor Who vibes. <laughs> Are you my mummy? Ew, no, get away from me. Shoo. <laughs> I 
After doing that, I started working on a hub level where you can pick out your unlocked weapons, pick your missions, practice fighting, and anything else I might decide to put in there later, like different costumes. First, I made a van that will be what you interact with to start the missions and tried repainting my original tile map for the sewers to use in the hub. It was about this time I started getting really tired of trying to do level art. I'm pretty okay with it from a straight on perspective, but this has an oblique perspective and that makes it way more difficult. I was painting over geometry I made in Blender originally, which I covered in a previous devlog, but after doing that I still wasn't getting the results I wanted, so that led me to reevaluate my views on using asset packs. Asset packs, and add-ons as well, have a negative connotation for a lot of people because of the infamous asset flip games scattered all over Steam, and similar platforms. I have historically been very against them, mostly because I felt I couldn't really control how my games looked in addition to the stigma they carry. I also had a larger personal bias against using asset packs or add-ons because I thought it meant I wasn't good enough to make what I needed myself and that somehow made me less of a developer. While the fear about how people would react to using asset packs was arguably valid, my belief about what it meant for me was very naive. I've come to accept the fact that using asset packs and add-ons are not only fine but sometimes necessary. Especially if it comes to tools or other things that would take just way too long to do yourself or to do well enough that it doesn't cause big issues for you in the long run. I still think you should try and do it yourself first, if you think you can, but there is a point where, for the sake of your sanity and the timeline of the project, looking into asset packs and add-ons becomes more of a necessity than a luxury. After finally getting fed up trying to get a look I felt was good, I finally went on itch.io and found these packs by Bacteria that are at the same resolution, similar color palette and perspective, and have a large amount of options for me to use to create my levels. I made changes to them to match the palette I'm using, which you should make sure is allowed for the asset pack you select, and now I have really nice looking levels that will only need a little bit of work for me to add stuff that's missing instead of making everything from scratch. I think this pack is really good and this artist has a lot of different themes already and is working on more that I get access to as free updates, so it should give me plenty to work with in a style to emulate if I need to expand it myself. You can let me know in the comments what you think about using asset packs, I'm curious to see if others share my opinion on them. Alright that's it for episode 6. Like I said in the beginning, I'm pleasantly surprised with the work I did for this episode, and I think I'm starting to finally get more comfortable with Godot and its intricacies. For the next episode, I want to update the project to 4.4 and try and clean up the project for real this time. As far as the other stuff I'm going to do, I'm not entirely sure. I have some ideas, but if you want to see what I'm going to be focusing on, you'll just have to stay tuned for updates about that. Also, I really would like to say thank you for all the people who subscribed after my last video. I was so afraid no one would like it or that it wouldn't be worth watching after it took me so long to make, but you guys proved my fears wrong. I was shocked with how nice the vast majority of people were and just how many people liked the video. I also saw some people who were OG subscribers, and don't think I forgot about you either. Thank you for sticking around. You guys are all awesome, and I know it's early, but I really love this little community we have here. I know I talked about making a Discord potentially, and I think that would be fun in the future, but for right now I'm going to hold off on that. If you still want to keep updated on what I'm working on though and interact with me, you can follow me on Twitter here and Instagram here. Like the video if you did, subscribe if you want more, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!